okay? In the north, around Mandalay, this is called Upper Burma. The south is called Lower Burma, around the delta, uh, where Rangoon, this is an old map, obviously, uh, where uh, Rangoon is located. Now, uh, not too many years ago, uh, Burma was the biggest rice exporter in Asia. And here, of course, is the main rice growing area. Now, long before these boundaries that you see on the map were drawn, uh, ethnic groups from the north uh, up here in what would be uh, Yunnan, China, ethnic groups began drifting down uh, south into this valley of the Irrawaddy. Some of the groups settled in the rich uh, agricultural lands, but many uh, stayed up here in what are uh, highlands, mountains, and valleys, and uh, remained. They clung to their uh, old traditions, to distinct languages. These uh, groups have names like Chin, Shan, Kayan, Kachin, and there are officially today some 135 of these ethnic groups. Now, these groups have remained uh, tied to uh, their, their, their traditions, uh, and they even have connections uh, with the places that they came from. So we have uh, the Kayan up here, still uh, with relations to China. We have uh, these groups down here, Rakhian province, uh, with ties to India, which is where they came from. And of course, this big purple uh, are the Shan, and uh, they still are closely identified with Thailand, which is over here. Um, this is the area known as the Golden Triangle. All right, uh, where Mr. Goodrich uh, set foot, I think. <laughs> At any rate, the point is that geography has reinforced this disparity of ethnicity. The peoples in the river basins here thrived. They built cities. They uh, had kingdoms and they dominated the area, while on the other hand, the hill dwellers stayed remote and they were relatively poor. The basin people are called Bamar, and that became the word Burma, Burmese. They are now about 70% of the population, though that figure is based on a uh, the last census, which was taken in 83, 1983, it was unreliable then, and uh, understand statistics uh, are very vague in that part of the world. Now, uh, there is a fascinating history of the monarchies that grew during the first thousand years, a few thousand years, between 500 AD at 500 BC and 1700 AD, our times. Unfortunately, we haven't got time this morning to go into this history, but I have to mention uh, the two or three maybe main points. And one of them is, oh, here are the, you can see the disparity geographically. Uh, these are the hills, the mountains that are on the borders of the flatlands with the river running through it. All right, now um, Buddhism came to Burma from teachings in India. Uh, the kings embraced the belief of Buddhism and it has been embedded in Burmese culture ever since and remains to this day. I'd like to say that again, it is embedded in the culture today. Uh, even uh, nowadays, uh, little boys are expected to spend some time in a monastery, uh, older ones maybe a year or two. Uh, and of course, if you're a poor family, 
uh, a monastery is a place where your kid gets fit. Uh, this is the abbot. He eats well. <laughs> uh, there is a dedication ceremony today of little boys going into the monastery. Um, so it is a, uh, a, a central part of Burmese culture. You learn about life in the monasteries. Now, the kings at that time built the incredible pagodas that tourists uh, now go uh, to Burma to see. Uh, Pagan is probably the main uh, attraction. Uh, incredible temple complex. Uh, however, it lost its world heritage status because the military junta decided to build a few modern ones to attract more tourists, and they were pretty vulgar. At any rate, uh, the original Pagan was built by a king uh, called Anurata in the 11th century. Uh, Anurata is uh, a very famous monarch. Actually, he murdered his uh, brother and a few others to get control of the throne, uh, so maybe he needed some merit, which is why pagodas are built, because according to Buddhist belief, you achieve merit uh, by building such a monument. Now, uh, there are many wonderful myths about these monarchs. They killed giant chickens seduced mermaids, did other things to get hold of the thrones. And these early rulers were all powerful. They were like demigods. This has relevance today because it is commonly uh, thought that Tan Shui, uh, one of the last uh, dictators, really believed uh, he was uh, a reincarnation of one of these early monarchs. Uh, he insisted that his family converse in the ancient court language uh, to prove it. Now, uh, the last of this line of monarchs was unseated uh, by the colonial British when they came in in the 1880s. Uh, of course, now by 1880, the British were already in India. Uh, this last king, a young guy called Theba, uh, in the royal tradition, he had already um, sewn up a number of his family competitors to the throne in velvet bags where they were beaten to death and then thrown off a bridge. Uh, the British were shocked. Uh, but nonetheless, his supporters wept openly as this young king was marched by British soldiers down to the riverside and put on a British boat and exiled to India. He never saw his homeland again. And if you like Myrmese in history, the British had done the same thing to the last Mughal emperor of India, only they sent him to Burma, where uh, he uh, lived until he was almost 90. At any rate, about British colonialism, they ruled Burma in kind of an off-handed uh, way. Uh, if you've read George Orwell's Burmese Days, uh, it's a story of his own experience in Burma. Uh, it's a, a horrible book in some ways. Uh, the local Burmese were referred to by the British as darkies and niggers. It is quite bizarre because, of course, Burmese are very light-skinned. Uh, it, it was a, a, a signal of the racism uh, involved in that colonial period. The British came because they were mainly interested in trade. They wanted the teak forests. Scots traders came because they had wonderful gems, the rubies. Uh, British banks by the end of the 19th century were appearing in Rangoon, Lloyd's of London, uh, the Strand Hotel, a British hotel. If you've been in Rangoon, you know the old Strand Hotel is still there, magnificent, five-star, 
450 bucks a night when you like to play it. Uh, the ethnic groups on the borders, however, uh, were treated differently by the British. They had something called the Frontier Service, and this left these ethnic groups, the chiefs, the Sawas, as they were called, uh, more or less alone. And many, in fact, were converted to Christianity by British and, yes, American missionaries. Who could tell that this was going to be the source of uh, great divisions in the 21st century? The real transformation of Rangoon came uh, from Indians uh, who came as money lenders. By 1900, half the population of Rangoon was Indian. Now, uh, of course, those who had held power under the monarchs uh, were dismayed by the new order of things. The monks felt that the British were anti-Buddhist. There still is the shoe issue. If you've been in Southeast Asia, you know that Westerners uh, get put off by having to take off your shoes in the pagoda. The British refused to walk in their shoes in the pagoda. And by 1930, uh, groups were being formed in opposition to British colonialism. Think 1930. At the same time in India, uh, sure, Nehru, Gandhi were doing the same thing. A bunch of Burmese university students began calling themselves the Thaksuns. It meant master. Uh, it is what they had been required to call uh, the, the British, it's an honorary title like Sai. And now the Toxins uh, call themselves that because it implied that they were the true rulers of Burma. World War II came along, and at the start of it, the British further antagonized India, Burma, by simply declaring they were at war with the Axis Axis powers without ever asking anybody in India or Burma. In Burma, the local police, uh, the soldiers simply deserted when the Japanese invaded. <coughs> now, a guy called Aung San, oh sorry, that's another, uh, that's the Shwedagon pagoda. A guy called Aung San uh, became the leader of these toxins. Uh, they were called the Toxin 30 Comrades. He believed the Japanese when they told him they would give independence to Burma if the Toxins fought on the side of the Japanese. The Toxins went to Japan, were trained by the military, but it soon became evident that the Japanese had another agenda besides independence for Burma. So the Toxins switched sides and then began fighting on the side of the Allies. And at the end of the war, Aung San was able to negotiate a uh, independence for Burma on very liberal terms. When he looked next door at India, he saw the bloody results of the uh, antagonism between Muslims and Hindus, the partition. So he decided he was going to avoid that in Burma. And an agreement was written in 1947 that provided for a federal type of government, recognition of the desire for autonomy by these ethnic groups that were around in the hillsides. Um, they even had the right of secession after a certain number of years. Now, tragically, Aung San was assassinated in the very first days of independence. Maybe he was the only one that it could have brought unity to this battered uh, situation in Burma. Uh, so the years of independence were started under the leadership of a guy called Yu Nu. Yu is simply uh, a, uh, a, a something that means honorary mister. 
so we call him uh, Yu Nu. Yu Nu was a charming man. Uh, he had been part of the student independence movement. Uh, his student papers reflect that he wanted to be the next George Bernard Shaw of Burma. Uh, maybe a philosopher poet was not what was really called for at that moment. There were many problems in the newly independent country. For one thing, Chiang Kai-shek's army, pursued by the communists, was spilling over into northern Burma. Burma had its own communist party. Furthermore, the tribal areas uh, were getting into the drug trade, and they were otherwise, uh, ethnic groups were becoming uh, very restive. So you knew tried to implement socialist policies. Unfortunately, the Korean War in the early 50s disrupted the economy, ruined the rice market, which had been the main uh, feature of the Burmese economy. There was economic disaster. Uh, Yunu was a devout Buddhist. He called for a World Buddhist Conference in Yangon. Then he made Buddhism the national religion, which of course didn't sit well uh, with those who were Christian. Uh, he thought he was promoting unity, but in fact he was alienating a part of the population. In a very peculiar sequence, you knew simply resigned, uh, and he handed over the government to a general by the name of Nay Win. Uh, Nay Win uh, tried to pull the country back into some sort of order. He did make Yangon a more orderly place, but then they held another election, and Yu Nu got himself elected again. Uh, it was getting into the 60s, and now there was even more disorder, more chaos. And this was the motive for a military takeover by Ne Win. He came back into power. Now, Ne Win actually had been one of the early student nationalists. And this second coup was defended at that time and has been ever since by the military junta as something that was necessary to keep Burma unified, to keep it from falling apart. The military formula for unity uh, was very quickly made clear. Uh, those students who were in opposition were fired upon. Uh, the foreign newspapers that criticized the government were quickly closed. Monks were now required to uh, hold identity cards. And you knew himself, the philosopher poet, was put into prison. Now, during these years, under Ne Win, there were more or less constant small protests. <coughs> The economy was in a downward spiral. It was obvious that Ne Win uh, was a bit unhinged. Uh, at one point, he uh, crashed into an expat party out in the Dangan district and punched a Scots uh, uh, embassy official in the nose. Nobody ever knew why he did it. Uh, more serious. He was deeply spiritual. He uh, thought nine was his lucky number, so he declared a demonetization of all of the Burmese currency except for bills that ended in the number nine. Uh, he said it was in order to let him live to be the age of 90. Uh, but of course, it created havoc in the economy. Now, these frustrations uh, led to even more demonstrations by 1988. And by 1988, Aung San Suu Kyi had uh, arrived, quite by coincidence, 
in Burma. She had come because her mother had a stroke and she was there to take care of her. The military, because of the rising frustrations and the demonstrations, had promised elections. They were finally held in 1990. Aung San Suu Kyi had become the leader of what was known as the National Democratic League, the Democratic Party. And uh, this party won those elections in 1990. The military was taken by surprise. So they declared that the elections really weren't about leadership. The elections were really to elect a constitutional uh, forming group. They weren't about electing leaders. And uh, this was a shock because for the first time, perhaps, the world was now watching what was going on in Burma. And this was part of the significance of Aung San Suu Kyi. Because of her beauty, because of her family relationships, uh, she was an international figure, and now the world was watching. The other difference by 1988 was that Burma's neighbors, the big ones, China, India, as well as some of the other uh, Southeast Asian nations like Vietnam, uh, Singapore, Malaysia even, uh, were bursting into the economic scene, rapid growth, and this made an even bigger contrast with the dilapidated state of Burmese economy. And during these times, the junta was very busy selling off Myanmar's oil, timber, gas, to Thailand, to China, and the profits were kept for the elite and their cronies. So, by 2007, the monks were beginning to lead marches in opposition uh, against the government. Uh, they were peaceful, but they shouted their disgust uh, with SLORC, which was the abbreviation of the Quinta. It was also called the Tapada. The monks turned over their begging bowls to register the fact that they wouldn't accept alms from the military. It was a gesture of disgust. This was called the Saffron uh, Revolution, which is somewhat odd. Yes, uh, there are a couple of guys in saffron robes, but by this time, most of the monks uh, were wearing these rust-colored uh, robes. You remember it was the time of the Rose Revolution. We had the Orange Revolution. Uh, this was in the Ukraine uh, and Georgia. Anyway, uh, we called it the Saffron Revolution. It brought about an even more violent reaction by the leading general, whose name was Han Shui. He arrested all of these people who appeared out on the streets. Worse, they invaded the monasteries, uh, arrested, dragged the monks out, and killed a number of them. Uh, I have to say, um, I was first in uh, Burma in uh, 1980, uh, again, there in the early 2000s, and it was so obvious that there were fewer monks on the streets, fewer monks everywhere uh, by 2012. Either they were afraid to come out of the monasteries, or there simply weren't as many. Um, anyway, there was further agony in the 21st century when the Nargis typhoon hit. Uh, that was only a few years ago. Maybe some of you remember uh, uh, the pictures of that. But let me just go back for a minute, because uh, this slide is supposed to do, have to do with Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, it's a 2012 slide, but it shows that her um, uh, league, the Democratic League, uh, was able to set up recruiting booths right on the main street. 
and these were in every village I visited, and they were in many places in the Yangon. Uh, if you made a donation to the National Democratic League at one of these places, you can see it's a kitchen, uh, they fed you for free. Mm -hmm. It is a Burmese custom to feed people. It's a Buddhist thing. Uh, and so you, I bought a couple of t-shirts and you sit at a big table with other donors. Anyway, this is about Aung San Suu Kyi. This is uh, what uh, life was like after the Nargis uh, typhoon. And the generals at that time further outraged the world uh, by refusing uh, to allow foreign help. Uh, the U.S. Navy sent ships which actually stood off Yangon uh, in the Bay of Bengal, and the military thought uh, that they were a threat to Myanmar sovereignty. And you have to understand that part of the paranoia of this military government has been that a U.S.-backed coup would take place either through Thailand or another of the neighboring countries. So the question today is, have we got real change in Burma or not? Oddly, the change started coming about in 2010. Uh, it was an election that was held that the National Democratic League refused to enter. Uh, it was declared a, a fraud by the few outside observers that were there. But the military, the junta, who won the election of 1990, said now it was going to transition to a civilian government. And all those guys in uniform took off their uniforms and put on suits. <laughs> now, um, yes, it was more or less the same people, but uh, things were different. Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest. A new leader by the name of Sen Sen was sworn in as the president. He started releasing political prisoners, just a few at first. Probably, however, the key move was the halting of the Chinese back dam in the north of Myanmar. Uh, it was known as the Miyatsoni Project. The electricity was to go completely to China, and the local residents objected to the fact that they were being removed for the building of the dam. And in response to those civilian demonstrations, the government told the Chinese to shut the dam and get out. Um, the, uh, the, the leadership then said that they would begin to release more prisoners, which they did. Uh, when the uh, junta said, we will now allow peaceful demonstrations in the street, Aung San Suu Kyi and the NDL entered the next elections which were held in 2012. That was in the spring of this past year. There were 45 contest contested seats for the parliament. The NDL, the National Democratic League, won 43 of the 45, which gave you some idea of their popularity. Uh, thinking uh, about these little stands which were set up all over Myanmar. At any rate, uh, now, Ten Sen is being reinvented, sort of, as a uh, person who has always been more reformist than his colleagues in the junta. Um, remember, this guy was very high up in the government during the repressions of 1988, but now he is being called the Michael Gorbachev of Burma. The next scenes you've probably seen are Hillary Clinton, hugging Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, yes, uh, Obama arrived, uh, lifting U.S. trade restrictions, and uh, spoke at, symbolically, the old Rangoon University site, 
which the junta had deliberately let fall into disuse. It had moved the students out of Rangoon. So when Obama said he was going to speak there, they hurriedly had to come in and remove the cobwebs uh, from classrooms that hadn't been used in years. Now, uh, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the future? Uh, I have to put my cynicism into sort of a worldwide uh, view of looking at nations in transition. Uh, yeah, I think the Arab Spring is iffy. Uh, it's a hard road from authoritarian rule to uh, something more democratic. I've seen with my own eyes uh, places like Kosovo, Kyrgyzstan, yeah, Kazakhstan. Uh, none of those places are doing too well in a democratic way nowadays. Yeah, Estonia, Latvia, uh, much better. They came out of the Soviet rule. But remember, they had a democratic past. They experienced it. Uh, and also, they had a very modern educational system. Now, uh, culture, history make a difference. Uh, Myanmar slash Burma, as I've, I've emphasized here, comes from a very strong authoritarian tradition, central monarchies, and reinforced by strong Buddhist beliefs throughout uh, the whole population. And uh, if you want to focus on the built-in problems, um, we, we tend to think that the media uh, gives us pictures of Aung San Suu Kyi, Obama's speech, and maybe we'd like to think that celebrities can really change history. Um, if you saw the movie about Lincoln, we might be persuaded to think that, but in real life, in 21st century life, globalized politics, a country's self-interest and its power politics are paramount. The junta has moved uh, because they're nervous about Chinese uh, influence and not because they have any innate respect for democratic procedures. Uh, this Chinese influence is evident uh, everywhere, both economic investment, uh, China's maritime claims now in the South uh, China Sea, and of course, uh, the U.S. sees China's rise as a problem. Um, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, sees China's rise as a problem. And this is the basis of the U.S. pivot policy, our new foreign policy, that says we are moving the emphasis out of the Middle East into Southeast Asia. Now, uh, but you have to remember that in Burma, those who held power under the military, uh, they've profited economically through foreign contracts. Uh, this is in the last 10 years. Like those people, that the oil and gas guys that I was talking to, um, some of them are really rich. Uh, the elite give uh, huge weddings daughters draped in diamonds. Uh, you can see big mansions in Yangon. I was never invited, but I saw them from the outside. <laughs> now, these folks are still there. They're not giving up without a struggle. China is already the biggest investor. Uh, 14 billion invested in 2011. They are backing an oil and gas pipeline uh, from the Bay of Bengal up into Yunnan. While the U.S. has stood aside with our sanctimonious sanctions, um, Singapore, Taiwan have been there big time. Huge projects, uh, apartment buildings, hotels, office towers in Yangon. Now these interests are commercial. They're not political much less are they democratic. And all of this has happened under a totally corrupt state, one with no legal business environment. 
uh, none of these actors are in favor of giving up their commercial profits and rights for human rights or more democratic elections. Yet, and Sen may be genuinely responding to the people's unrest about government scams, maybe he really desires open connections with the world, but there has been such a black hole in education in this country. There are no trained technocrats. There are no sophisticated employees uh, to implement uh, business, government reforms, uh, to get their economy going the way the 21st century uh, demands. Now, um, less noticed by the outside world, though we've talked about it today, uh, but very disruptive to any plans for transition, are these ethnic groups uh, on the border. They are, some of them, intransigent. They will not become part of uh, Burmese unification. Uh, yes, uh, just this past week, uh, the government has been bombing a group called the Kayin, who are up on the Chinese border uh, with Russian-built planes, apparently, old ones. Anyway, the Kayin are now suing for peace because the Chinese are uh, the brokers for peace in that village where the Kayin uh, hang out. But whether that peace will last, uh, who can tell? And lastly, and this is just a personal comment, I may be totally wrong, I personally see that that Buddhism, uh, that fatalistic belief, uh, it is perhaps the factor that make the Burmese so gentle, so smiling, so hospitable, so loved by tourists, um, a kind of uh, passiveness, this search for harmony that is part of their belief. This has been partly responsible for the past 40 years of oppression. And uh, I don't know if that will change, despite the fact that some of the groups of the monks, yes, are visibly confronting the military government. Well, I would like to be wrong. Uh, I would like it if the educated people, the 60-ish people that I knew, and some of these young uh, types that I taught, would get it together and really carry out the reforms that the leaders are prattling about. Uh, I have to say that on the all-important oil and gas deals, there's something called the Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise. It's M-O-G-E. It's an agency. It says it's offering many new exploration blocks to all of these foreign companies. It plans to join a wonderful thing called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. <laughs> okay, that's to encourage uh, more foreign investment. The uh, Asian Development Bank says Burma is supposed to grow 8% a year in the next 10. Um, the oil and gas sector, by the way, is very important. Uh, it accounts for 77% of foreign investment. Um, Obama has said that he will authorize U.S. firms now to invest in these new tracks that are being opened up. Um, I might just add, as a, a, incidentally, a sidebar, uh, despite uh, sanctions, Chevron has been there all along. Uh, they bought out a firm called Unical in 2005. Unical at that time was 15% owned by the Myanmar government. So you might construe it that Chevron actually has been in business with Myanmar uh, since 2005. At any rate, uh, ports are now being built to encourage this foreign trade. Uh, Indian companies are building a modern port uh, in Sitwe, which is on the Bay of Bengal. Myanmar 
is slated to be chair of ASEAN. ASEAN has taken the position that we need to include Burma into our family of Southeast Asian nations, and it will uh, modify its be behavior. So they are going to let it to be let it be the leader of ASEAN uh, next year. Uh, Burma is going to host something called the Southeast Asian Games later in 2013. Unfortunately, the host of the games uh, is allowed to choose the activities of the games. And Burma didn't make a very good start. Uh, they eliminated the traditional ones like tennis tape, uh, table tennis, ping pong, um, regular tennis, uh, and some of the things that the other Southeast Asian countries are good at, and they substituted traditional dance and kickboxing, kickboxing activities that are done by the tribes in Burma. So it doesn't give a very good picture of what they may do as the leader of ASEAN. Nonetheless, uh, there is maybe no guarantee against continuing cronyism and corruption. But all of these things are commitments to the outside world that do force openness. Now, uh, just this month, several student leaders from this generation, 88, were released from jail. Then Sen had promised this earlier, then reneged on the actual day, only let out a few, because hardliners in the junta had objected to who he wanted to release. But a couple of weeks later, he actually did release all of those people that he had promised. And it's an indication that the forces of reconciliation did prevail. In a typical Burmese whisper story, a monk uh, was said to have been imprisoned for years, one of these 88 generations. Uh, after many years in leaving, he turned to his former prison guard and said, uh, I am sorry that you have had such a terrible job, that you have been doing the bad things that you were required to do, but I want you to know as I leave, I forgive you. <laughs> it is not only a typical Burmese rumor, it is important on a global scale. In Syria and in many despotic countries, one reason for the hanging on of these tyrants and their supporters is the fear of revenge by those that they have oppressed. If Myanmar and its Buddhist belief proves the exception, certainly the world would be a better place. Thank you. Singapore 
uh, entities. Where I went to the um, wedding reception was in a gated community way over the river that was uh, funded by the Singapore Bank. Very elegant. Uh, what you don't see uh, are the holes in the pavement and the sidewalk. Uh, yes, many people live along the rivers. This is rural, uh, rural Myanmar. Uh, many people make their living on boats, fishermen. So when we talk about Chinese dams uh, interfering with the fishing, that is a big problem. Uh, and this is what I uh, gathered about the pervasive Buddhist belief. In my neighborhood, we had monk talks uh, at night, two or three nights running. They put down mats on the sidewalks and in the streets. This is a street. And uh, people are simply sitting there uh, listening to the monk uh, you can see he is also up on the screen. People leaning out of their apartment windows uh, to listen to the talk. Uh, the monk arrives uh, with uh, uh, an entourage and of course the umbrella uh, designating uh, his special status over his head. And uh, these women uh, were simply our neighbors, the people that, that lived uh, around me. Out in the countryside, it looks very much uh, the way it did uh, when I was first in uh, Burma in 1980. Things haven't changed very much out there. No electricity, uh, usually no running water. Here you can see uh, the woman is getting your water from a well. These are <coughs> wonderful old teak houses, uh, usually open on the bottom, where they do whatever activity, making floor mats or whatever uh, that they do for sale. Uh, this picture is taken from the old Mool Men uh, pagoda. Maybe you remember reading uh, Kipling's wonderful poem by the old Mool Men pagoda looking lazy at the sea. There's a Burma girl a sitting, and I know she thinks of me. Uh, so this is the view uh, from that wonderful pagoda uh, of the Salween River. Uh, this is the Mulmeen uh, pagoda, but interestingly, down here, these walls that you see is the Mulmeen uh, prison. It is the old colonial prison, and it is now the prison for the military. Uh, it has been increased in size uh, from the colonial. Uh, and this happens to be the world's largest reclining Buddha, which gives one some idea of uh, its remaining importance. And I included this so you could see uh, this, I, can you read it in the back? It says, the world's biggest laying down Buddha, uh, 400 cubits, builded by uh, Win Sein Sayata. Anyway, these are Burmese names. Um, and it lists all of the family members. And then it says, with best headed by both our parents, donated by Uthong Win, Thanh Win, wife and the family, etc. People are still giving big money uh, to Buddhist causes to achieve merit. Uh, this is a uh, very deep, deep in the culture, in the tradition. Uh, we think monks and we think it's a separate sort of uh, group. It is not. It is very much part of the culture. And yet, uh, oh, I forgot that I had this one in here. This is one of the, uh, it, it is probably the most, next to the Shwedigan, the most sacred Buddhist spot uh, in all of Burma. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's known uh, as the Gold Rock 
for the hanging rock. Uh, the rock is held there by a hair of the Buddha's head, and many people uh, come to worship. Um, it is a, uh, to be a real pilgrim, you walk up to the rock, but uh, people, old people like me, uh, who can't, um, you get carried in a chair, and uh, it, it is a very uh, important pilgrimage spot. I'd forgotten I put this in here. So, <laughs> along with all of that, we have modern music. And maybe they are the ones that are going to make a change. And they look like youth everywhere. If you've been in Hong Kong, if you've been in Shanghai, if you've been in Mumbai, that's what youth looks like. And uh, I end with a picture of my wonderful students. And I cannot tell you why they have such shiny, it, it was my flash somehow that reflected on their faces. Uh, there's nothing on their faces that makes it look like that. But here are three guys uh, from my class, and this particular one, um, who called himself Charlie, uh, is sort of a token of modern Burma. He fled with his family across uh, into a refugee camp in Thailand, uh, he was in fifth grade, never went to school beyond that, learned to speak Thai. So now he was back in Yangon having to learn Burmese, Myanmar language, as well as trying to learn English. And what did Charlie want to do? He wants to be a rock star. <laughs> so I'll leave you uh, with that. And uh, now, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Uh, and now I think uh, the pattern is here that we do questions. Is that we right? do uh, a few minutes of questions, and um, we'll be handing out a mic. And remember, you want to uh, hold the mic this way, and we will get to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Maya. I was just wondering uh, if the Chinese influence was so strong, because today, today is the... Chinese Buddha New Year, and it's the day of the snake. <laughs> and I just wondered if they would be celebrating that there. Uh, I can't tell you uh, exactly <laughs> how and what they would be celebrating. I can only tell you, yes, there were many Chinese families very much part of the Burmese culture in Yangon. Uh, Chinese were there from the late 40s when they came partly from the nationalist side with the soldiers, but also there was a very strong Burmese Communist Party, and that was supported by Chinese Communists. And uh, Chinese Communists, uh, and, and Communists in general, have been part of the political scene in Burma low these many years, despite the fact that the military would like to get rid of them. Uh, I ate dinner every night uh, with a Chinese family, a Chinese family that ran a little restaurant around the corner from where I lived. Uh, they spoke Myanmar, but they were Chinese. So when I went in and said, Ni hao, they said, Ni hao, but I think it was as foreign a greeting to them as it was to me. But uh, they are uh, much more part of the population of Yangon than some of the ethnic groups who are actually Myanmar. Uh, that's not a very good. What they're celebrating, I can't tell you. <laughs> Could you expand a little bit on the uh, Cayenne uprising and, and the the reasons behind that and the causes for it uh, in North Burma? Uh, the Cayenne are Christian. And uh, I have only done enough research to know, oddly, that the missionaries were American. And I, I can't explain that. Uh, but apparently they were. And the Cayenne are on that border with China. 
China doesn't want to be involved in any unpleasantness having to do with borders with Myanmar. So they uh, apparently the junta decided the way to finally settle the Cayenne's hash was to bomb them from the air, which they did about two weeks ago. And uh, that just made the Cayenne sort of an international, it was in all the newspapers. But last week, from what I read in the Irrawaddy, which is the paper, it's a, a Thai paper that I read online, apparently the Chinese uh, uh, came to be moderators of the peace talks. So the junta sent, the, the Myanmar government sent a representative. He actually sat down with the Cayenne guy and they agreed that there would be a truce with their hands being held by the man from China. Uh, the difficulty is that um, they have made dozens of these peace treaties with the ethnic groups before. And it doesn't seem to hold because local militias start acting on their own and there are local feuds uh, within these tribal, I mean, I think you can see the picture. Uh, 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 Naipadaw, which is now the capital, the, the uh, it is far away, and these places are quite remote, but maybe they will hold. It is important for the transition uh, that the energy of the government not be diverted to putting down these kinds of fusses. Uh, what the government needs to do is use all of its energy, all of its thinking power to try and uh, shape the reform. And what you've got to, uh, what it's so hard for us to understand is that these generals, most of them have never been out of the country. I got a teaching offer uh, email uh, from a guy who said, I want you to go up and teach international relations in Naipadaw, in the capital. He said, most of the generals have never gone beyond fourth grade. They need to know about the outside world. Now, that may be just Burmese whisper. I can't believe that they have not gone beyond fourth grade. But I can believe that they are, have been so isolated um, that they are not able to make judgments um, in accordance with 21st century realities. That's the problem. And this is true of so many tyrants. Um, they remain dictators and they are surrounded by cronies and they don't really understand. We, as an educator, it's why we need to have foreign students coming to this country. We need to send our students overseas. So when they grow up and they get to be important in politics, they have some understanding of the world. Lecture number two, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was really admiring your, the way you referred to Buddhism as an avid student of Buddhist philosophy. It's wonderful. And now my question. Uh, do you think it's possible, after all, the Chinese have been in Southeast Asia for many, many years and have dominated the industrial, commercial sectors. Do you think that it's possible for these people to retain their culture, even in the face of the Chinese sort of picking them up economically? Is that a possibility? What a wonderful question. How, do I have five minutes to answer? Okay, let me say first, 
thank you for what you said about Buddhism because I'm very sensitive. We have many uh, Zen people in California. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to put my foot into that because I'm afraid of being obnoxious. Uh, at any rate, uh, I, I'm glad if it came across all right because I have great respect for the idea of Buddhism. Politically, it's an, another factor. But this business of losing um, identity. One of the places I taught was an upscale elementary school. I wish I could show you the pictures. It would look pretty good in Marin County. A beautiful architectural building, three stories high, built by a guy who made a fortune in air conditioners. He devoted, is devoting himself to education. Science is the main uh, curriculum in this elementary school. They had a science fair while I was there. It looked exactly like Marin. Um, when I talked to this wonderful man, he said, the thing I am most afraid of is we can educate our kids in science. They will become part of globalization. But I am so afraid we will lose our identity as Burmese. And I guess um, that is the dilemma of our times. How do we become modern without losing who we are? Uh, and uh, that applies to the West. Uh, we have somehow are further along this road, but in these very traditional societies of Asia, particularly Burma, I mean, why are all the tourists going to Burma? They want to get a quick look at this world that is disappearing from our view. And um, that is tragic. It's even more tragic for those people who are in there and who realize it's happening to them, like this wonderful man. And this guy who is starting this school, according to Burby's Whisper, is very close to Aung San Suu Kyi, and what he is trying to do is substitute his curriculum at this fancy elementary school for what the monks are teaching in the monasteries. Now that's cultural, what, engineering? <laughs> yeah. So thank you for your good question. Another dilemma of modern times, in addition to the one you just elucidated, is the question of what does a power like the United States do in relation to the hypocrisy, the fraud, the um, fog, if you will, that you've been explaining to us of a developing country. So if you were to be asked by Secretary of State Kerry and by people in the Obama administration to counsel them on our next Obama three years or so of relating to this country, what would your counsel include? I think I have one minute left. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, one of their approaches is the military, because we are sending our military into the South China Sea. Uh, it has nothing, Burma, Myanmar, has no dog in that fight about the South China Sea. But our presence that close to Southeast Asia is going to affect all of the Bay of Bengal. Uh, I can't tell you because what I saw in Yangon, the place is awash in NGOs, do-gooding people, American Cultural Center, my God, we are so busy being good that it's uh, nauseating. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know, because 
I don't see this, and again, it's my cynicism coming to the fore. I've been some 30 years now since my husband and I first went to China to teach in 1979-80. I've seen so much of this NGO stuff around the world, and it seems to be doing less. There are more of them. They are accomplishing less. And I am getting old and cynical, yeah. so I, I don't know, but I know that um, one thing you don't do is try and put your own values in a place that is so traditional. And um, the young people, they are already awash with K-pop. You know, that's the big thing in Asia. Uh, I mean, you've seen that dance? Uh, that's what allures them. Not necessarily talks about democracy or elections or all of the things that we think are important. So it's, I guess my dilemma is that I'm the wrong generation to be asking because my values are more like yours. And uh, internationally, I just don't know. It's a dilemma. So uh, this is the end. Last, one last question. Oh, all right. OK. Aung San Su uh speaks beautiful English. You said that she returned to Burma because her mother was ill. Where was she educated, and where was she living? Oh, my god. Aung San Suu Kyi uh, is a international person. Her mother was uh, the ambassador to India under Yunu. So she grew up as a teenager in Delhi uh, at a fancy British type school, then went to London, uh, Cambridge, where she studied. She worked for two or three years in New York for the UN as a representative, uh, as on the staff of Burma. Uh, her, her husband is a British, uh, was a British scholar, um, a great pioneer in the study of Tibet and Nepal. That's how they got together. But he was sort of not derided, but considered an outsider because he had never gone to school in a monastery in Burma. Uh, he, he's British, of course. He was British, of course. And um, uh, I haven't talked about her because she's been so much in the press. She is undoubtedly a tremendously courageous woman. Think about being locked up in your house off and on for 23, four years. She's grown old. When her husband was dying, she didn't leave because she knew she'd never be allowed back. But uh, she is a scholar, not a politician. Um, well, I guess that's all I can say. Well, thank you, Gloria, for a wonderful presentation today. <laughs>